Hey y'all, this is Troy. So I heard a prophetic message from the Lord, and this prophetic word has to do with Kevin Zadai. I heard this back in February of 2022. The Lord told me to wait until July of 2023 to actually record this and publish it. His backstory is years ago, he died on the operating table and they brought him back. And what he claims is that he spent about 45 minutes with Jesus before he came back. God actually started to speak to me about Kevin and he actually told me whether his story of having this heavenly encounter is true or not. And I'm gonna be sharing that in this video. So there may be some people watching who would ask the question, well, how do I know if I can trust you or not? How do I know if I can believe that this is really from the Lord or not? And scripture tells us to submit prophecy to the church and then for that prophetic word to be tested. And so I'm actually going to be explaining later in this video how to test prophecy and how you can know whether someone's speaking from God or not. There's a lot of different prophetic words and even teachings online nowadays and in various churches that we hear from all sorts of different sources. How do we know, right? That's the question. How do you really know? Because some people will say, well, you just got to have discernment. And it's like, well, can you explain that to me biblically, right? Or you just got to test the spirits. And it's like, well, how did you test the spirits? Did you do it in a biblical way? Or did you just arrive at this conclusion based on your own understanding? What does the word say? It says, do not lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. So if we are not acknowledging God in the process of testing the prophetic word or even testing what someone is sharing or saying, we're going to miss God's perspective on it, and we're going to arrive at our own understanding. And I believe that this is a problem in the church today, and I'm not saying this from a judgmental perspective, but from a heart of, I know that this is something that God is wanting to mature in the church. It's something that he's wanting to address because he loves the church, because he wants us to be walking in alignment with his will and his perspective. So the Lord asked me not to share this until a year and a half after I heard it. I waited until now. This is what I heard on February 19th, and there's actually a series of prophetic words the Lord has given me about Kevin over the last year and a half, and I'm going to be sharing all of those in this video. I heard the Lord say, I want you to talk about Kevin Zadai, and then the Lord began to speak to me about how this video was actually going to be a sacrifice for me. I'm actually going to read what he said. He said, because many people will not listen, he said, but do it anyways. The next thing the Lord told me was he said, be obedient nonetheless. So there are some times where I hear words from the Lord and I'm excited about sharing it. There's other times where I'm like, Lord, I don't know how this is going to land, right? Like, I don't know who's going to like this, who's not going to like this, and who's going to agree with me, who's not. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter who agrees with me. The only thing that matters is if God actually spoke something and he's telling us to do something with what he said, are we being obedient or not? At the end of the day, the only person we need to please is the Lord. And if we're seeking to please people, our heart is not in the right place. And this is one of the reasons why God is sharing this message. The Lord began to say that the reason behind this was to bind up the wounds the enemy has left in his wake, the destruction he has caused among my people and in the earth. And he said, I'm healing broken hearts right this moment in my glory. So this is something I believe is going to happen as you watch this video. Many of you are sensing it already. And as I'm speaking what God spoke to me, I'm sensing the glory of God here in the room with me right now. But the glory of God is going to come, for many people listening, is going to confirm not just what I'm saying, but what the Holy Spirit has been saying, not just to me, but what he's speaking to your heart personally and what he's doing for the body of Christ today. I heard the Lord say this next. He said, fixes are coming from my throne room. My spirit is addressing the old wounds. So I'm going to stop right here because I sense the Holy Spirit saying that some people listening, there are wounds from past church hurts. There are wounds from even your childhood, things your parents did or said or didn't do or didn't say, uh, friends growing up, people in middle school, high school even. So for some people, friends in college or teachers or pastors you had at the moment where your identity was being solidified and you were asking that question, who am I? What is my life going to look like? And you had people speaking into your life at that moment that weren't necessarily speaking the full truth. And this is not for everybody, but the Holy Spirit is saying for some people, the Lord is addressing those issues and he's saying, let me heal the hurt. Let me heal the wounds so that you can move forward. I hear the Lord saying, I want to. I want to bring healing where there was hurt. 
And I want to reveal the truth to you where lies were spoken so that you can move forward with my grace and in my glory. See, God has a glorious plan for each Christian's life. Is it an easy plan? No, it's not always easy. Is it a perfect plan in in our sense? Is it what we want? Not always. But God's plan is perfect from his perspective. And in order to walk out that plan, sometimes we need to allow the Lord to address the things in our hearts that are standing in between us and him. And I believe that's what God is wanting to do, and he's wanting to bring healing. There are some people watching this video who you're just watching this for kicks, and you would have to admit, you know, I don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. This is my encouragement to you, is to ask God right now as you're watching this to reveal himself to you in a real way. And I believe the Holy Spirit will begin to reveal Jesus to you, reveal the truth of who he is, and that you will begin to have a real encounter with God today if you'll open up your heart to him. And you'll say with a genuine heart, Lord, I want to know you. If you're there, I want to know you. The Lord will respond to that. In uh, the Gospels, who were the ones that did not receive healing from Jesus? And I'm not just talking about physical healing. I'm talking about emotional healing. I'm talking about cultural healing, all the different things that we need healing from. Who were the people that did not receive the healing? It's the ones that didn't come to him for it. The ones that didn't respond to him passing by. But everyone who came to him got healed. The Holy Spirit is issuing that same invitation to every person listening today. Saying, just come. I'm right here and I'm ready to heal the hurts. I'm ready to heal the wounds from the past. This is 2 Corinthians 1, 3-4. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. See, we look for comfort in so many different places. Sometimes we go to the worldly things, right? Other times we go into church and we go into theology and we think the more I know the more I'm going to be comforted, the more I'll be whole. But the word says we are complete in Christ. Our wholeness is actually found in him. If we don't find him as a person, we don't interact with Jesus on a personal level, we're not going to be experiencing the completeness and the wholeness that God has for us and the comfort of the Holy Spirit that God wants to pour out upon us. This is verse 4, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. There are some Christians who believe that God calls us into suffering and that he's not going to comfort us through that suffering because it's going to teach us or train us or it's going to mature us. You know, the suffering itself does those things. Listen, the word says that God comforts us in all our affliction. So if God is asking you to walk through something, he's walking through it with you. If you're going through the water, God is right there. If you're going through the fire, God is right there. And yes, he can teach us things in those moments, but listen, he's not teaching us void of his presence with us. So when we go through those things, it's not to test our strength. It's to reveal how weak we are and how much we actually need him. And the test is not how strong am I? Can I keep doing this? Can I keep, you know, persevering? The test is, am I going to humble myself and turn to him for help? Am I going to rely on him? instead of myself and what I know and what I can do and what I can make happen. This is an amazing promise from Romans 5.5. 5. It says, And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. When we understand what the scripture is actually saying here, it can radically change our lives. Hope that does not disappoint. So even in the middle of disappointment, we're not disappointed. <laughs> Why? Because we have an eternal hope that we're experiencing the down payment of right now through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance. And if you're not experiencing that amazing supernatural eternal hope right now, call out to the Holy Spirit and he will begin to comfort you. He will begin to give you that hope in the middle of no matter what you're going through. And the way he does that is he pours the love of the Father out into our hearts by reminding us of how God demonstrated his love See, the word says that God demonstrated his love to us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So no matter what we go through in this life, we can look at Jesus, look at what he did for us, and we can know, man, God loves me more than anyone else will ever love me. God is love. He's got the only perfect love I'm ever going to find is in him. The only perfect fulfillment of love I'm ever going to experience is when I'm experiencing him, when I'm encountering him. The only way to actually walk in love is to abide in him. Man, that's good. (laughs) That's good news, y'all. This is what I would encourage you to do is don't let past wounds harden your heart against what the Holy Spirit's trying to do. The devil will try to lie to you and try to point you back to those things. Say, look what God allowed 
But the Holy Spirit's going to point us 2,000 years back and say, look what God allowed to happen to his own son, to himself, so that you could be free. That's where freedom is found in that moment of understanding what Jesus did and why he did it, because of the amazing love of God for us, even when we didn't deserve it. That's freedom. It's amazing. I'm about to share what I heard on December 23rd of 2022, but I do want to say this. You know, Kevin Zadai talks a lot about this heavenly encounter he had. There are people online that talk about having heavenly encounters and things like that. This is what I will say is the Word of God warns us that in the last days there's going to be many false prophets, many false teachers. So not everyone who claims to have had a heavenly encounter is actually telling the truth. And sometimes what they thought was a heavenly encounter is actually not heavenly. It's more demonic in nature. So we need to be careful. And I'm going to actually be explaining how to tell the difference in a second. I heard the Lord say this on December 23rd, and I knew he was talking about Kevin Zeta. He said, he really did come and see me. So the Lord has personally confirmed for me that, yes, what Kevin is saying is true. It really did happen. And that's part of the picture. When I'm looking at somebody and I'm saying, Lord, you know, is this person actually speaking from you or not? You know, are they do, are they actually telling the truth? Part of the picture is, Lord, what are you saying to me personally? And that should be for all of us, right? We should all be asking that question. Lord, is this someone I need to be listening to? Is this somebody who's telling the truth, right? Is this someone who's connected to you? But there's another aspect of testing the spirits that's not mentioned as often as that, and it's understanding when the Holy Spirit is working. See, as Christians... We're not going to always feel the presence of God 24-7. Now, some people do, and that's amazing. But most Christians would say, I don't experience the tangible presence of God 24-7. But when you begin to experience His presence in that way, here's my encouragement. Pay attention. And God can and will use that, the knowledge of His glory being present, to confirm what somebody is saying, whether it's from Him or not. And what's the other way that we can confirm that what someone is saying is from God? Is what they're saying actually biblical? Is it scriptural? And this is what I would consider the starting point for testing the spirits. Is is what they're saying lining up with the word of God? And here is what I found to be true. Is some Christians tend to come from a critical spirit. And what ends up happening is they will agree. You know, and I get this criticism a lot as well. But what they'll say is everything that you're teaching sounds great. It's very biblical. But I don't like it when you start to prophesy or when you start to talk about this encounter. And my question would be, if I'm lying about an encounter or a prophecy or if I experienced something that was demonic and not from God, listen, I would not be able to teach the word accurately because I would be under another influence. So if somebody is accurately preaching the gospel message and teaching the word of God, and teaching truth, and it's obvious. Listen, that's a very good sign that they're actually hearing from God. And that's a testimony that the things that they're claiming, that they're experiencing with the Lord is actually true. But I've also experienced the opposite. I've seen people who talk a lot about heaven. They talk about heavenly encounters and all these angel visitations, and then they start to teach from the word, and they completely mess it up. And it's very obvious that moment something's wrong. (laughs) You know, if you can't even teach the gospel message in its pure and simple form, there's something wrong there. This is what I heard on March 5th about Kevin. And so this part's a little odd. Sometimes the Lord speaks in riddles, in pictures. Sometimes he'll speak in puzzles. I mean, just look at Jesus in the parables. Look at the Old Testament prophets. You know, it's all through scripture, but sometimes he speaks very clearly. But this is kind of a funny picture that the Lord gave me. This was on March 5th of 2023. I heard the Lord say, Captain Kevin, he's my friend. And then I began to see this vision of Kermit the Frog, but he was dressed as Captain Smollett from Muppet Treasure Island, which was a Muppets movie that came out in the 90s, I think. And he's this like captain of a ship that's sailing to Treasure Island to try to find the treasure. And it's based on that story, Treasure Island, but it's a Muppet version of it. And I heard the Lord say, Captain Smollett. So I knew that's who he was talking about. And what happens in this film? So I believe the Lord is painting this picture to kind of give you the story a little bit. Miss Piggy, if y'all know the Muppets at all, she plays Captain Smollett's love interest. She's been marooned on Treasure Island. And when he gets to Treasure Island, he finds that she's there. And that since leaving her, she's gone around and she's dated all these other pirate guys. And one of them marooned her on this island with the treasure. And this is the picture I believe that the Lord is painting is that 
Jesus ascended, but he's coming back for his bride. But sometimes because we're waiting and we're not seeing what God is doing, we're not putting our hope in what God has said, we start to look around on this earth, on this quote unquote island that we're on, and we start to go after other lovers. One of those lovers being treasure or money. We start to go after things we think that can fulfill us here. When the truth is the only one that can actually fulfill us is coming back. He said he would come back. But in the process of waiting, this is why God has set up the church the way he set it up. Why he's given us apostles, prophets, teachers, preachers, evangelists. It's for the equipping of the saints. Listen, God wants to speak to us while we're here in the waiting process, waiting for him to come back, putting our full hope in him. And he speaks to us through people a lot of the time. This is why it's so critical to understand when the glory of God is moving and when it's not. So we can know who to listen to and who not to listen to. I heard the Lord say this recently as I was studying for this video and I was praying about it. The Lord said, Jesus is the only one who's coming back for his bride. He said, is my bride looking for her lover and friend? Or is she still occupied with the treasures of this world? I also heard this word, and this is what I believe the Lord is actually using Kevin Zadai to do. It's one of the callings that he has on his life. And this word is about maturity. I believe what the Holy Spirit is speaking is it's time to grow up. And there's certain people that when they speak, man, it's going to rub us the wrong way. But the problem is the Holy Spirit is using them to convict our hearts. He's also using them to point out things that we've believed or we've said, ways that we've tried to live out this Christian walk that don't actually accurately reflect the heart of the Father. I heard the Lord say this. He said, Captain's courageous. That same night that I saw the vision about the frog captain and all that, Captain's Courageous this is a story that was actually written by Rudyard Kipling in 1897. It's a novel. It's been like turned into a couple of different films over time. But the story is basically there's this rich, spoiled young boy who gets lost in sea and gets rescued by a fisher vessel. And the captain of the vessel takes the boy on and says, hey, you can work on this ship, but we're not taking you back to shore right away. And the boy's trying to convince them that he's rich. He's like, no, I've got all this wealth. I'll pay you to take me back. And they don't believe him. And they're like, hey, we'll let you ride on the ship, but you have to work to earn your keep. And so he rejects the idea at first, but over time he learns to mature and he learns that there's a benefit in not only thinking about himself, and by the time that he gets back to his parents at the end, that his parents look at him and say, wow, he has matured so much. And they thank the captain, you know, not just for rescuing him, but for whatever it was he did to help him in his journey in life. And I heard the Lord say this. He said, oh, how I desire my church to mature and to grow up into all I have called them to. This is Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. It says, therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness. I'm going to stop right here. When our eyes are set on Jesus Christ, and we see what he went through, we see what he was willing to give for us, and we see the heart that he has for the church, something inside of us begins to change. Something inside of our hearts begin to melt for him. We long for him. We long to please him. And we start to look at our own lives in a very different light. And we start to ask this question, Lord, what could I be doing that I'm not doing? And it's not in a legalistic way, and it's not in a works righteousness way, but instead it's in a response. You know, the word says we love because he first loved us. And Ephesians, Paul is explaining in chapter 4 what this maturing process looks like. He's explaining what we as the church should look like. And so he goes on and says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. A lot of times you look around in the church and we just don't see that. And I'm not saying this in a judgmental way, y'all. I'm saying there's some maturing that we have to do still as the body of Christ. And then, and then he says, being diligent to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And then verse 11 says, and he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. So now he's talking about what is the role of the people that God has placed in the body to build up the body. And what's the purpose? The purpose is what we just read at the beginning of the chapter where he's describing what a mature Christian body will look like. 
when it's operating in maturity. And then he says in verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. How on earth are we supposed to attain to the unity of the faith? How are Christians supposed to walk unified when we have so many divisions and so many opinions and all these different denominations, all these different things? There's only one answer. And I believe we should all be working towards this. The only way it's going to happen is if the Holy Spirit does it. The only way it's going to happen is if we humble ourselves. We begin to say, Holy Spirit, I disagree with these people, but you show me. You show me if they are from you or not. You show me if they're in line with you or not. You show me if this is someone I can walk in unity with who knows you or if it's somebody who's outside of the fold that I can't walk in unity with. But the Holy Spirit is the one. Listen, that is why the glory of God is so important. I want to just encourage you. I've got a few other things to share, but I want to encourage you. If you do not experience the glory of God or you don't experience His tangible presence and you feel like that's something you never experienced, listen, this is not a weight on your shoulders. This is not you not being mature or something like that. But my encouragement would be to ask. Just simply ask. Say, Father, this is something I want. See, Gideon had an angel come to him and the angel told him what God was calling him to do. Listen, and he still had to ask for confirmation. And God was willing to give it several different times. He kind of had a thick head. You know, it took a little while for the confirmation to work, right? But God was willing and God is still willing today to confirm what the Holy Spirit is doing. And one of the major ways he does that is through his glory, it's through his presence. And so just as a personal example, I don't agree with everything that Kevin Zadai says. There's no teacher that I agree with everything, and probably everybody could say that, right? But oftentimes, if I'll turn on one of his YouTube videos or something like that, you know, if I'll listen to him, I'll experience the glory of God in that moment. It's like the presence of God comes and rests on the message. And he's not the only one. There's a lot of people, and I'm not perfect at this, y'all, but that's how I decide who I listen to. Is the glory of God resting on the message or not? There's some people where, man, it sounds great. It sounds super intelligent. But it's like, where's the confirmation? And I would also encourage you to let this be a personal thing. (laughs) Because sometimes God is going to use that sign or that wonder. He's going to use his presence to confirm that, hey, this is who you need to listen to. But maybe it's not who everyone needs to listen to. So this has to be a personal walk. Don't just mimic what someone else is doing. But talk to the Lord about it. And I believe the Lord's going to be faithful to bring that confirmation. So after hearing all this stuff, the Kermit, the Frog Captain, Captain's Courageous stuff, I I literally was thinking, Lord, this kind of sounds silly. And I have that thought a lot. But the Lord told me, he said, you're going to have to be a fool if you want to move forward. And this reminded me of the story of Michael and David in 2 Samuel 6, 16. And it says, then it happened as the ark of the Lord was coming into the city of David that Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked down through the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she was contemptuous of him in her heart. Another translation says she despised him in her heart. This is David's response to her. In verse 21, he says, I will celebrate before the Lord, and I might demean myself even more than this and be lowly in my own sight. See, David understood the heart of God. He was a man after God's own heart. And all he wanted was to know God. All he wanted was to please God. All he wanted was to worship God. And the word says that David was actually a prophet. He was actually looking ahead. He prophesied about the coming Messiah, about those whose sins would not be counted against them, He wasn't talking about the law. He wasn't talking about the sacrifices. He was talking about God's grace. And he was prophesying about the grace of God that was going to be poured out. And through David, God actually fulfilled his promise to Abraham. Abraham, the father of the faith. And the promise was through Abraham's seed, the entire world would be blessed. And the ultimate fulfillment of that was Jesus Christ who came through the lineage of Abraham and then David. And in that moment, Saul's daughter, Michael, she was not just rejecting David's worship of God. She was rejecting God's plan for humanity in sending his son through the lineage of David. She didn't realize it, but in that moment, she was missing out on the abundant life God had for her. But David was enjoying it. (laughs) David was getting it. And this is what I'm sensing from the Holy Spirit right now. Sometimes the joy of the Lord seems silly. Sometimes the glory of God comes when we're least expecting it. Sometimes he shows up and he demonstrates his power in ways that we wouldn't have chosen. But it's in those moments where we need to decide, am I going to make this life about me? Or am I going to recognize that God is a person 
that he has thoughts and he has feelings, he has desires, and that he gets to make decisions that I don't have any say over. (laughs) The question is, do I want to walk with him, this person whose ways are so much higher than my ways, whose thoughts are so much higher than my thoughts? Do I want to walk with him truly, or do I want to walk on my own and stay in my own thoughts and stay in my own opinion and my own will? Or do I want to come over here into his will and walk with him even when it seems odd to me, even when it's not what I would have chosen? I want to finish by reading just one more passage from Ephesians. This is Ephesians 4, 17. It says, So I say this and affirm in the Lord that you are to no longer walk just as the Gentiles also walk, in the futility of their minds, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. This would be my encouragement. Don't harden your heart against what the Holy Spirit is saying today. If God's speaking something through me, or if he's speaking something to you personally about somebody else or something else, Don't harden your heart against his voice. It might not make perfect sense to your mind, to your intelligence, to even what you've been taught, but if it's in line with what he's doing and saying, it's worth listening to. Then he says, And they, having become callous, have given themselves up to indecent behavior for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is, is in Jesus. Saying truth is in Jesus. So in order to know the truth, we have to know him. We have to meet with him personally. Verse 22, that in reference to your former way of life, you are to rid yourselves of the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you are to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. And then verse 25 says, therefore, ridding yourselves of falsehood, Speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, because we are parts of one another. Be angry, and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Do not give the devil an opportunity. The one who steals must no longer steal, but rather he must labor, producing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with the one who has need. Let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, but if there is any good word for edification according to the need of the moment, say that, so that it will give grace to those who hear." Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. All bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and slander must be removed from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. So this seems like an impossible thing to live up to, right? All of these things, it's talking about a mature body. Yet at the same time, God is not expecting us to get all these things right on our own. That's why we need the help of the Holy Spirit. So I would encourage you right now just to cry out to the Holy Spirit. Just say, come Holy Spirit, I need more of you. I need my thoughts to be renewed. I need my ways to be aligned with your ways. I'm surrendering my life to you. This is something we probably need to do way more often than we currently do as Christians. Say, Holy Spirit, I surrender my thoughts to you. I surrender my life to you. I just want you to do that right now. If you can, if you can close your eyes or lift your hands or safely, if you can't do it safely, don't do that. But just surrender your heart to him. Say, Holy Spirit, I belong to you. I'm yours. I surrender even my day to you, Lord. I surrender my goals to you, my plans. Lord, I surrender my dignity to you. Like David, I will be undignified if I have to in order to please you, in order to praise you, in order to walk next to you, Jesus. Because that's what we want, Lord. We don't want to just talk about you. We don't want to just point people to you, Lord. We want to walk with you. We know that apart from you, we can do nothing. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I ask that you fill every person listening with the Holy Spirit. That you would renew hope right now. Renew that sense of peace and that joy and that love through your presence coming. Thank you, King Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I hope you all have enjoyed this video. If you want to find out how you can support these videos, you can find that information at TroyBlackVideos.com. If this is the first video that you've watched on my channel, maybe stick around, subscribe, watch a few more videos. I love you all so much, and I'll see you next time.